This is an Dateline 29 News special report, Attack on America. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stacey Horst. I'm Pedro Echeverria. My grim-faced President Bush addressed the nation tonight, mourning the deaths of thousands of Americans in today's terror attacks in New York and Washington, D.C., and vowing to bring killers to justice. It is a day of terror, death, and fear unlike any this nation has known. But thousands of people are dead or injured after what appears to be coordinated attacks on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. We have team coverage tonight. The first of two reports, we begin with Jim Hanchett at the Pentagon. Well, good evening. President Bush is vowing to track down and punish the individuals, the organizations, the countries responsible for this. Tonight, enormous lights are shining down on a big gash in the side of the Pentagon. Smoke is still rising from the rooftop. It is one of many wounds tonight to people, to buildings, and to our sense of safety. As rescuers press on after a day of diabolical terror, hijacked planes piercing the World Trade Center in New York, slamming into the Pentagon in Washington, and crashing into a Pennsylvania field, President Bush says, gravely, quiet. the U.S. is standing with steely resolve against evil. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. The explosions begin at 8.42 a.m. Eastern Time. Hijackers, armed with knives, direct an American Airlines plane into one tower of the 110-story Trade Center. 21 minutes later, a United plane slices through the other tower. At 9.40 a.m., hijackers send an American flight smashing into the Pentagon. Back in New York, one tower of the Trade Center collapses. A minute later, a United flight nosedives southeast of Pittsburgh. Finally, at 10.28, the other Trade Center tower falls. The dead, and there could be thousands, include workers in the buildings, police and firefighters sent to help them, as well as the 266 aboard the planes. Government and corporate buildings across the U.S. are evacuated, including the White House and the Capitol. Airports are shut down. Terrorism experts say Osama bin Laden is the most likely suspect, although bin Laden supporters deny responsibility. The president puts the U.S. military on its highest alert, deploys Navy ships along the eastern seaboard. God bless America! At the Capitol, congressional leaders rally on the steps and vow to be in session tomorrow. First, though, families mourning, survivors still trapped, and rescuers face a night of desperation. No hard numbers yet on the dead and injured here at the Pentagon. At least 500 are injured. At least 60 are killed. It is a fraction, though, of the loss in New York. For the latest there, let's go to Kendis Gibson. And, Jim, there are a lot of developments here in New York. The George Washington Bridge right now, traffic has been stopped because the FBI is en route to investigate a report of a van found with explosives inside. The New York Police Department made that stop earlier this evening. The FBI en route to the George W. Uh, Bridge right now. In the meantime, a miracle story. Two police officers were found beneath the rubble of the World Trade Centers. All of this, developments, continuing to unfold. Within an instant, a terrorist attack has changed life in New York City. Rescue workers continue to comb through debris, searching for any victims. There's thousands of people dead. It's, it's horrific. It all starts around 9 o'clock this morning. One of the two World Trade Center towers is on fire after a hijacked airliner slams into it with dozens of people on board. There's bodies everywhere. They're all on fire. It broke and it was the most horrific thing you've ever seen in your life. Some 18 minutes later, a second commercial airliner slams into the second tower, sending a huge fireball into the air. This is a vicious, unprovoked, uh, horrible attack on innocent uh, men, women, and children. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Within hours, the 31-year-old towers came tumbling down becoming a rubble of memories. It just collapsed. The whole thing is not even a girder standing. It's like they didn't even exist. Late this afternoon, a third building in the World Trade Center complex collapsed. Several hours after the attacks, New York City remains under a state of emergency. New Yorkers 
in a state of shock. And once again, at this hour, the FBI en route to the George Washington Bridge to look into a report of a van filled with explosives en route to New York City. The stop was made by New York police officers earlier this evening. That's the latest live in New York. I'm Kendra Skipton. Let's go back to you. Thank you, Kendra and Jim. Joining me now is Kirk Martini. He's an associate professor at the University of Virginia School of Architecture. He's also a licensed civil engineer. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm happy to be here. Uh, one of the things that strikes me and has strikes a lot of people about this situation is that the towers continued to stand for a good amount of time, even after they suffered such impact. Can you tell me what you know? What it, what made them be so structurally strong at that point? On these buildings. Uh the, the structure is in two parts. There's a perimeter uh, set of columns and an interior set of columns. And because the building is so tall, its uh, wind loads are very important and it has a, a lot of structure. Most of the structure that's there is to keep the building from moving in the wind. So it's it's extremely a uh, redundant type of structure, especially the outer uh, core. Okay. So why did they implode instead of explode? Those jetliners that hit them were just full of fuel for a cross-country trip and yet the buildings did not explode. They just seemed to implode. Why is that? It appeared what happened on the South Tower is that the, uh, the intense heat from the fire uh, started to soften the columns in the structural core in the center of the building. As the columns heated up, they softened, and then they eventually buckled under the load, and that the core failing would then bring the floors down, and that would pull the outer columns inward, and so you saw that straight-down collapse. Okay. And you were, we were talking earlier, and it seems like it was kind of a domino effect, I guess, the South Tower being maybe responsible for the North Tower fall. Yeah, it was, you know, the, the North Tower was struck first, but collapsed last, and the, the North Tower lasted an hour and 45 minutes, and the South Tower just lasted an hour. Uh, it seems quite possible that the collapse of the South Tower may have caused damage around the base of the building and the underground substructure, that then propagated damage in the North Tower. And it may be when this is all studied, we may find that if the South Tower had not collapsed, the North Tower might not have collapsed either. So what is it that, uh, why did the North Tower stand longer than the South? It appeared that the, the uh, strike from the aircraft was higher up in the building and less likely to cause a collapse there. Okay. And one more question, I guess. Um, what's the likelihood? Uh, we've, we're hearing reports that people may possibly still be alive trapped inside this building. What are the, what's the likelihood of that? Um, it's, it's possible. It's, uh, it's in, in Oklahoma City and in other earthquakes, earthquakes in Mexico City, survivors have been found long after the earthquake in Turkey. Um, and I've heard reports of cell phone calls. We don't know. Um, but it's not impossible. All right. Kirk Martini, thank you. Thanks very much. Pedro? Stacy, for many of us, we watched the destruction of today's events from the safety of our own homes or at work. But for one Charlottesville family, the attack on the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. came all too close. The Pritchett family was driving on Interstate 395, less than a mile away from the Pentagon, when the plane slammed into the building just before 10 o'clock. Here, Danny Pritchett tells us what he saw. What I saw was, was just a quick flash of a plane come over and hit the ground, a big ball of fire, and traffic just started getting crazy. Oh, there was emergency personnel that got there so fast, rescue squads. Uh, ambulances, everything, and, and, and police, state police, I mean, they just wheeled in so fast. They was hauling people on, on stretchers and people running. I mean, everybody was just running everywhere. The roads, people was going up the wrong side of the road. State police, emergency units was trying to move people. You just you just couldn't get through it all hardly. Pritchett also picked up a couple of pieces of debris from the destruction of the Pentagon. The Pentagon in D.C. was the next target after New York. A plane crashed into the west side of the building around 9.45 this morning. And former Charlottesville resident Jeffrey Wilberger was in downtown D.C. at work only blocks away from the White House when the plane slammed into the Pentagon. Beth Duffy spoke with him in Charlottesville today, and he was one of the few who was able to get out of D.C. today. I work at uh, 17th and Pennsylvania Avenue, which is uh, one block over from the White House, and uh, our building's up on the 13th floor. So we have a pretty good view of the city and uh we, we had all been sitting around you know checking out what was happening in, in new york city and we had just commented about you know it's kind of surprising that something like this never happens in in washington dc and not more than a minute or two after that we realized that you know the pentagon had been hit by a plane yeah, and then we had one of the managers come around and say you know there's something going on we're not really sure what but everybody just get your things and get out of here as orderly as you possibly can there were a couple of co-workers that were that were pretty hysterical because they had they, they were saying that they had relatives that work in the pentagon building 
So, you know, they were they were getting their things together, you know, they were tears rolling down their face, you know, wondering what to do, how, how could they get in contact with anyone, try and find out what happened. I think everyone in general was concerned because a lot of the commuters in that area, they, they don't drive to work, they take the train. And with, you know, potential terrorist actions going on, taking mass transit probably wasn't the smartest way to get out of the area. So people were, you know, concerned about how they were actually going to get themselves out of the city. I think we found probably one of the last available cabs in the city. And then you could see the traffic starting to pick up. Everyone was on their cell phones. Everyone was kind of scurrying around frantically. And uh, we beat all the traffic out because I've never gotten out of Northern Virginia any faster than that. Traffic was light at that point. But then once we got out of Northern Virginia and got on 29, we heard about the gridlock on 395, 495. And we were sitting there thinking, we're right next to the White House. Actually, a co-worker said this. We're right next to the White House. Uh, you know, this, if, if it's going to happen to the Pentagon, it could happen to us. And another co-worker said, well, you know, the White House probably has pretty good security. And then the first guy said, well, you know, I imagine the Pentagon has pretty good security as well. And they were still hit. So I think right then is when everybody realized, you know, we need, we need to get out of here because we're in this real close zone to the White House. We could be, we could be next to those. And a Pentagon spokesman says there are extensive casualties and an unknown number of fatalities. A former Secretary of State under former President Bush says today's attack clearly shows the need for better security at the nation's airports. Lawrence Eagleburger now lives in Albemarle County. His opinion is while finding out who is responsible for the attacks is important, the larger question is how four aircraft managed to be vulnerable to hijackers. He says the investigation should focus on local airport authorities. Something needs to be done first of all in those airports to find out what sloppy procedures were conducted and we're going to have to tighten this issue this, in this area all around the country and that's going to make it more difficult to get on and off airplanes and so forth that's a price we're going to have to pay Eagleburger adds that heightened security may mean that the way we travel may have to be drastically altered in order to assure that the potential for hijacking is drastically reduced Though he adds that there is no way to say for certain that this type of terrorism never happens again. And as speculation over who may be responsible for today's acts of terrorism grow, one local expert on foreign affairs shared his thoughts with our Luke Ducey. As I was watching, um, there was a plane flying around both of the buildings, and I figured it was just, uh, just a plane checking out the scene, and then it, uh, it crashed into the second building, and there were more flames and smoke. A former Virginian describes what she saw looking out of her Manhattan window early this morning. Hours later, when the dust settled, the devastation became more clear. Now, there's speculation by one local foreign affairs expert not about whether terrorists are responsible for flying two airplanes into the World Trade Center in New York, one into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., but what group or groups of terrorists will claim responsibility? One context has been the, certainly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There's no question about it. The other context is Bin Laden context. Ramazani says these scenes are not the act of domestic terrorists. He says evidence points elsewhere. Osama bin Laden has taken claim for at least two embassy bombings in Africa and the bombing of the USS Cole in the Middle East. Many Palestinians celebrated today in Israel what Professor Ramazani calls a second intifada, or war against the West. One has to be careful that the overwhelming majority of the Palestinians are not for suicide bombing or killing and so on. But you always have the fringes. Fringes like Hamas or Islamic Jihad or both acting together, says Ramazani. This is really the worst act of foreign terrorism. This takes a lot of that of doing, a lot of planning in a magnitude of this and the simultaneous nature of the attack. This is a wake-up call for America, this local expert says, that the war of terrorism is being waged and now it's hit home. No longer terrorists are that weak, they are able to do and penetrate, you know, who could believe? Luke Ducey, Dateline 29 News. And to get another perspective on today's attack on America, we are joined by Professor John Norton Moore from the University of Virginia. He is the director of the Net Center for National Security Law at UVA, and he is a former counselor on international law. Thanks for joining us tonight. Pedro, it's good to be with you. We are starting to process the devastating effects from this thing, but eventually our attitude will have to turn to shoring up national security. In your opinion, what's the president's role right now? 
The president gave a wonderful statement uh, today, right from the heart. He captured the country's great sense of grief and shock at this. He talked, I think, very appropriately about the courage of the Americans that were participating in the rescue efforts. And in addition to that, very, very importantly, he expressed the, the anger of the country and the determination that the United States of America will not let this stand, and it will deal with the scourge of terrorism. You called it crossing a line, I imagine. Now it is time to respond to that. It is indeed. Uh, we have been fighting terrorism uh, in a very concentrated way for the last 40 years, but they have now crossed a line that's very different in magnitude. They've attacked the continental United States in an attack that was intended, though hopefully we've avoided uh, most of that, intended to kill as many as 50,000 Americans in a single attack. Uh, this one has had devastating effects on financial markets all over the world. They've crossed a line. It is time for us uh, as democracies to pull together and say no more. This time we will end terrorism. And in this case, we are fighting a faceless uh, terrorist because we've not yet determined who the actual person or persons is responsible for this. I think that our intelligence community will, in fact, make a determination as to who is responsible. And I think you will then see the United States pull together with extraordinary courage and determination. There's been a great miscalculation by the terrorists uh, in this attack on the United States. And it's similar to the miscalculation by the Japanese at the time of Pearl Harbor. Which we've been comparing to this all night. Professor That's Moore, correct. thanks for joining us. Thank you for being here. Explosions lit up the night sky in Afghanistan's capital city today. The explosions came hours after the major terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington. U.S. officials have denied reports that President George W. Bush ordered any attacks on the capital city. Officials say it appears the attacks were ordered by anti-Taliban forces in Afghanistan. The hardline Islamic Taliban currently controls about 95% of Afghanistan, but it's not recognized as, as Afghanistan's government. Three U.S. military ships have departed Norfolk, Virginia, headed for New York City. Two destroyer ships and one cruiser are on the way to New York. The Atlantic fleet ships are going in support of defense and humanitarian efforts in the city. Cruiser ships are equipped with multiple target response capability. The destroyer vessels are commonly used to safeguard larger ships in a fleet or a battle group. In light of the terrorist attacks in Washington and New York, the Commonwealth of Virginia is under a declaration of statewide emergency. Jeff Krause has our story from Richmond. What? What? Smoke coming out of the Pentagon. Oh my God. That was the reaction from just about everyone in Richmond, including former Governor Doug Wilder, who was in the middle of a press conference when word first came down about the attacks in New York and the Pentagon. It's some um, very unfortunate uh, for the American people. Um, very, very unfortunate for those of us who believe in civility. Um, I hope that it isn't the act of terrorism, but you can help. You can't help but believe that it is, and if it is, you know that there will be swift and just uh, response. And the response was swift among Virginia officials. Governor Jim Gilmore has placed the Commonwealth under a state of emergency. And the reason that we have done it is because that this now uh, grants uh, uh, the greatest possible authority to the governor to manage all the emergency response resources in the most efficient and uh, effective manner possible to respond to, uh, to this situation or any other that might occur. Governor Gilmore has activated 300 members of the Virginia National Guard and heightened the alert of the state's Air National Guard. He's also heightened the alert of police agencies around the state, including here at the state capitol, which has been closed most of the day. As for what's already occurred, the governor says only time will reveal the scope of the tragedy. You know, it's uh, a great tragedy. It's a great human tragedy. We, we will, over the next several days and weeks, begin to fully absorb the human tragedy that is involved here. Uh, you know, as, a, as a governor that cares so, so much about individuals and their rights and liberties, you can imagine how I would feel with the, the deaths of so many uh, innocent people. At the state capitol, I'm Jeff Krause, Stateline 29 News. The deep sadness felt by everyone concerning today's acts of terrorism are also being felt very heavily in the Charlottesville area. Prayer services and vigils were held at many churches as people took time to come together. 
Our Ranji Sinha went out to see what was going on this evening. He joins us live at the University of Virginia. Ranji? Stacy, people did come together tonight to try to cope with the tragedy, and UVA students, who many of whom have loved ones in the Washington, D.C. and New York City areas, were no exception. UVA police estimate that three to 5,000 students and faculty came together at Old Cabell Hall. Many students were grieving, but all just seemed to come together to support each other, although many were still scared and shocked. And at first, everyone just talked about the complications or whatever we heard on the news, and then everyone just stopped talking and just kind of wandered around. It sort of, it, it really worries me because I'd always thought it'd be great to live in New York City or some other populated city, and this sort of really changes my mind about that. UVA Vice President Leonard Sandridge also pledged support to the students. Uh, but our intentions are to, to keep the university uh, operating uh, so that our students and our staff, frankly, uh, have a structure that's supportive and that will allow them to work with one another. Area residents also filled up churches as they dealt with the national tragedy. Uh, as people of faith, that is, uh, when you don't have the answers, one of the most basic things you can do is to gather together uh, and to, to, uh, to look at your grief and to experience your grief um, as a family in some form. The university is planning to keep two hours open tomorrow during classes to give students another chance to come together to grieve and support each other. Stacy. Ranji Sinha, live at the University of Virginia tonight. And students at UVA are receiving support and counseling this evening. Counseling services are available until midnight in Newcomb Hall and around the clock by calling the number here on your screen. It's 924-5556. Classes will not be held anywhere in the university tomorrow from 10 a.m. until noon so that students, faculty, and staff can gather to acknowledge both losses incurred today. We've got another cancellation that was announced tonight. The Virginia football game against Penn State that was scheduled for Thursday has been postponed and no makeup date has yet been set. The Thomas Jefferson Area Food Bank is standing by and awaiting word on how they can best respond to today's disaster. Federal officials have requested that no donations such as food, clothing, or other goods be sent at this time. The most effective donation is money. Cash donations may be sent to the Thomas Jefferson Area Food Bank Care of Blue Ridge Area Food Bank at the address on your screen. That's P.O. Box 937, Verona, Virginia. Tonight, blood supplies from all over Virginia are on their way to help the victims of the tragedies, leading to huge demands for more blood. This evening, an overflow crowd of donors descended on Fashion Square Mall on Route 29. Hundreds had to be turned away. A large percentage of the donors were high school upperclassmen and college students. Yeah, it was definitely a horrible day, but coming out here has been great because we've been able to see a lot of people who are here to help other Americans. We've been sitting home basically the entire day watching and um, some friends called and said they needed blood but we were afraid to overcrowd. There's a lot of lines um, but it's basically after a while I kind of feel helpless so we figured to come on over and see if we could help out a little bit. And if you would like to help out, here's the location of some upcoming blood drives. Tomorrow from 10 to 7, Fashion Square Mall will hold another blood drive, and then we'll hold a third during the same times on Friday. Also Friday, UVA's University Hall will hold a blood drive from noon to 6. On tomorrow, free bus rides will be available for any UVA students who want to donate blood at the Fashion Square Mall. And Dateline 29 News will let you know about any more blood drives to help the victims as we find out about them. If you're making plans for air travel, you're going to want to make other plans. The Federal Aviation Administration has ordered that all flights in all airports across the country be grounded. The Charlottesville Albemarle Airport was busy this morning. Passengers from the last few flights arrived safely. The airfield has been shut down and only security officials and airport workers are being allowed inside. We found one passenger who worked at the Pentagon. I was getting ready to go into work. And I heard on the radio that the Pentagon had hit, and it scared me, and it shocked me, and it made me a little bit more than angry. We're at war now. We're a country of war. We have been attacked, if not by a foreign power, then by elements that are being supported by a foreign power. And it's my honest belief that we should take whatever means are necessary, you know, Maximum military effort if necessary, uh, for sure we're going to take diplomatic efforts that are necessary to keep this from happening again. And FAA officials say flights can resume at noon tomorrow. 
And those authorities shut down all of the nation's air uh, traffic in the wake of the terrorist attack. And state police and Augusta County deputies helped seal off the Shenandoah Valley Regional Airport in Weir's Cave. As soon as they received word of the tragic events, airport authorities began implementing heightened security measures. We're uh, maintaining the perimeter of the property. Uh, at this point in time, we're concentrating our efforts on uh, uh, assisting some of the folks who may be um, delayed due to travel plans. Uh, this has affected our whole entire operation as well as our corporate and general aviation business as well. Uh, the airport is closed. We are not open for operations at this time. So uh, we want to discourage people from coming to the airport if at all possible. I encourage them to contact airlines directly to uh, reschedule flights. The federal authorities say the nationwide air service shutdown will continue at least until noon Wednesday. If you are trying to head north by train or bus, most service has been resumed. Amtrak says that dozens of passengers who usually travel by train will now be able to head north. Passengers on this 6131 Greyhound bus bound for New York also had to be rerouted. One University of Virginia student was headed to a medical school interview at Columbia in the heart of New York. So I was thinking, oh no, what am I going to do? And then I thought of all those people. So I think it's more important to think about the people right now. People have lost people in general, and it's really, I think, very important right now. If you have any questions about your rail or bus travel plans, you can call Greyhound at 1-800-231-2222, and Amtrak can also be reached at 1-800-872-7245. We're going to take a brief break from news and get a quick look at the forecast. Eric? Well, cool temperatures and clear skies continue to prevail on this Tuesday. 67 is our current reading in downtown Charlottesville, a strong rising barometer and uh, pressure at 30.17 inches. It will set the stage for a very cool overnight. 85 and 60 are high-low pair on this bright day, uh, a dark day of a national tragedy. Uh, September skies were quite clear. And... Uh, 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 records are certainly safe for another year. In terms of uh, current conditions at the Valley Airport, clear skies, 63 the current temperature, and should settle down into the lower 50s uh, in the Valley by dawn. A uh, light northerly wind at around 5 miles per hour. Put satellite in motion, you can see the absence of cloudiness across most of the eastern seaboard back across the Ohio Valley, thanks to a large ridge of high pressure building in from the lower Great Lakes. That area of high pressure will continue to slide toward the east coast, and as it does so, we'll ensure another beautiful day tomorrow with low humidity. In terms of the tropics, it has become quite active. Obviously, the last couple of days have been following the progress of Hurricane Aaron, which continues to pull away from North America, moving off to the northeast. It's now a Category 1 storm with winds at 85 miles per hour. Meanwhile, in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, we have Tropical Depression number 8, which could become uh, System Gabrielle. It's uh, winds at 30 miles per hour, bringing some soaking rains across the Florida Peninsula. And Felix, uh, which was named today, continues to move generally off to the north-northwest, but a more northerly direction is anticipated over the coming days. We'll continue to monitor the progress of especially Felix and Tropical Depression Number 8. In terms of our forecast for tomorrow, it will be uh, clear skies, low humidity, temperature either side of 80 degrees. A front across the Midwest may bring a scattered shower or storm in here late in the day Thursday. 56 for the overnight low under clear skies. For tomorrow, 82, more sunshine and comfortable. And for the valley tomorrow, look for temperature either side of 80 degrees. Should be quite pleasant. As we head through the remainder of the week, a slight chance of a shower or storm late Thursday. And then look at the cool autumn-like numbers as we finish out the last weekend of summer, which will be very autumnal-like. Uh, much more on the forecast a little bit later. All right. Thanks, Eric. Well, it has been a day of horrific events from New York City to Washington, D.C. Here's a recap of what's happened today. Shortly before 9 o'clock, a plane crashed into one of the World Trade Center towers in Manhattan. A second plane crashed into the other tower a little after 9. At about 9.40, a plane crashed near the Pentagon just outside of D.C. And shortly after that, the FAA shut down all aircraft takeoffs nationwide. Then, just after 10 a.m., one World Trade Center collapsed. That was about an hour after being hit by the plane. Also, around this time, FAA officials confirmed a large passenger plane crash just outside of Somerset County, Pennsylvania. At 1028, the second tower of the World Trade Center collapsed, and around 11 a.m., American Airlines and United Airlines discloses two each of their large passenger planes had been lost and were reported hijacked. Now, at this point, hospitals in the New York area are treating an unknown number of injured. Rescue personnel are assessing the damage and beginning the grim task of looking for survivors and the bodies of those killed. 
The number of fatalities has been estimated in the thousands. Well, we, of course, will be following this story throughout the night and we'll have continuing coverage of these terrorist attacks tomorrow. Dateline 29 News at sunrise. That starts at 5.30 a.m. Be sure to join us then.